For just a moment, close your eyes and imagine this. Imagine crystal clear turquoise waters glistening in the afternoon sun, lapping against the velvety white beach. Imagine a sky of pelicans and frigate birds swooping and gliding above a submerged world. Underwater forests of living coral, dazzling fish and great sea turtles, swimming and breathing in a quiet, liquid realm. Imagine a land steeped in a rich cultural legacy, from swashbuckling pirates to Danish sugar plantations, to a mysterious early peoples of earth and spirit. Imagine a culture where this vibrant island way of life still thrives, carrying on traditions hundreds of years old. Now open your eyes. This place, this paradise, is the Virgin Islands National Park where visitors from around the world take refuge from the demands of the 21st century. Spread across two-thirds of St. John, a tiny island jewel in the Caribbean Sea, the National Park is today a reality. A stunning oasis where spectacular waters, beautiful coral reefs, magnificent beaches, historic ruins, and hiking trails provide endless hours of exploration and enjoyment, as well as inspiration solitude, and reflection. Yet it's almost impossible not to wonder how in today's fast-paced world, where nature so often becomes the victim of commerce, did the Virgin Islands National Park come to be forever shielded from exploitation? The often quoted and somewhat misleading answer is that a wealthy philanthropist secretly purchased numerous tracts of land and then turned it over to Congress to sign into a national park. But the deeper answers to that question take us into a fascinating story of a West Indian community and its legendary leader, and of the two very different men who had one very similar vision. To protect and preserve the unparalleled beauty of St. John for generations to come. It is the year 1936. Jesse Owens stuns Hitler's Germany at the games of the 11th Olympiad. The guns of the Spanish Civil War foreshadow the Great War to come. Across the globe in America, after a landslide election, Franklin D. Roosevelt has just been elected to his second term as president. And FDR's most popular New Deal program, the Civilian Conservation Corps, has just opened its first camp in the U.S. Virgin Islands. Headed by Harold Hubler, or HAL by those who know him, the CCC's work there is hailed as a success. In 1938, HAL opened the first CCC camp in St. John at Calabash Boom. On this small island, seemingly forgotten by time, the Corps labored under primitive conditions, where roads resembled dry stream beds and brambles were sometimes cleared with flamethrowers. But in every direction, they were surrounded by tropical paradise. The following year, Hal received a special request from Conrad Wirth, the assistant director to the branch of lands for the National Park Service. At the time, the still struggling U.S. Virgin Islands were hemorrhaging money from the states, and in a bid to jumpstart the territory's economy to fiscal independence, VI Governor Paul Pearson had embraced the idea that St. John be considered as a park of some type. Throughout the 1930s, the territorial government and federal officials considered a number of options. Worth's directive to Hal was for an evaluation of just such possibilities. But even as Hal dutifully set about completing Worth's request, at the time such a plan would have seemed painfully unlikely. Though the Great Depression was slowly releasing its ghastly grip on America, by 1939, turmoil in Europe forced the country to turn its attention abroad. Then not long after Hal completed his report, Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, and America's entry into World War II scuttled all efforts towards a national park on St. John. Yet one could also argue that the right leaders for such an endeavor were otherwise occupied, or were perhaps occupied elsewhere. <laughs> 